Hi, I am Divya Jyoti Das and this is For the Love of Physics. So in my last lecture, I was talking about the special theory of relativity. In that video, I mentioned the second postulate which stated that the speed of light in vacuum is a constant for all inertial observers. What does that mean? It means that if I am at rest and I am measuring the speed of light in vacuum, I will measure it to be c. If there is another person which is traveling at very high velocity compared to me and he measures the speed of light in vacuum, he will measure it to be c. Two inertial observers, myself and somebody traveling at very high velocities, both of us will measure the speed of light to be the same, that is c, that is 3 into 10 to the power 8 meters per second. This simple fact about the nature of our universe has certain consequences. It has certain trade-offs. The fact that two different inertial observers in relative motion measure the speed of light to be the same also ends up creating a scenario in which measurements of distances and measurements of time periods are not absolute anymore. It means that two observers in relative motion may see that the distance between points may shrink and the time periods between different physical events may dilate just to make sure that the speed of light remains a constant. This is one of those non-commonsensical and even bizarre consequences of special theory of relativity that many people have a difficulty understanding and even if they understand it, they have a difficulty accepting and visualizing what's happening. And yet, it's a fact. 100 years of experimentation has given validity to these ideas. And in today's video, I'm going to talk about one of those consequences, which is length contraction. Length contraction is quite simply, when two observers are in relative motion, then the space-time fabric stretches and distorts in such a manner that the distance between any two points is not necessarily the same. One of the consequences of this kind of a phenomena is that whenever we measure the lengths of objects like meter scales or rods or sticks, then the measurement of their lengths in the direction of relative motion appears to have contracted with respect to an observer in relative motion. The important words to focus on are appears and relative motion. If you are not in relative motion, that means if you are at rest with respect to the object, then you will not measure any kind of a length contraction. You see, many times students ask me that, sir, is length contraction real or is it some kind of an optical illusion? Uh, you see, I, I feel why students get confused with this kind of uh, idea. Uh, because first of all, you have to understand that this is not any optical illusion. The measurement of length appears to have contracted. However, you need to understand that the measurements are always done by some observer. So it depends from the perspective of which observer you are referring to the length of an object. If you are referring to the length of an object from an observer at rest or an observer in relative motion. So for example, if I am holding this scale, this scale has a length of around 30 centimeters. Okay, fine. So according to me, the length of the scale is 30 centimeters. Now, if I start moving in a particular direction, okay, if I start going at very high velocities at a particular direction and I hold the scale with me, that means the scale is also moving along with me at that particular velocity. It means that the scale is at rest with respect to me, right? The scale is at rest with respect to me. So in that state, I will measure the length of the scale to be 30 centimeters. So in both these situations, when I as an observer am not in relative motion with respect to the object, I will not see length contraction. So when will I see length contraction? I will see length contraction when the object is in relative motion with respect to me. So if I am at rest and the object is in relative motion, or if the object is at rest with respect to you and I am in relative motion, only then I will see or I will measure the length contraction. So length contraction always happens when you're looking at an object in relative motion with respect to you. And we can derive the formula of length contraction using the Lorentz transformations by taking a very simple setup. So this is a simple uh, setup which shows the relative motion between two observers. 
So let's suppose I have an observer in the lab frame and another observer in the moving frame. So the moving frame may represent a person inside a, like a train or a spaceship which is moving with respect to the lab frame, all right? And these simply represent the Cartesian coordinate axis associated with these two observers. They are, let's suppose, scientists or some kind of a measuring device. So for simplicity, we have taken x, y, z and x dash, y dash, z dash coordinate axis for both these two observers respectively. And for simplicity, we are assuming that x and x dash are parallel, y and y dash are parallel, z and z dash are parallel during the course of its relative motion. And the origins of both of these two coordinate reference frames coincide at time t is equal to zero. And let's suppose that this second frame is in relative motion of velocity v, a constant velocity v with respect to the first observer, with respect to the lab frame, such that the second frame of reference, the second observer is moving along the x-axis. All right. This is the very simple setup that you may have seen. And let's suppose that uh, I provide some kind of an object to the second observer in the moving frame. So I give him some kind of a scale or a rod. All right. I give him some kind of a rod and he's holding that rod in his hands. So as the second observer is holding the rod in his hands, they are moving in the positive axis. All right. They are moving in the positive x axis with respect to the lab frame. So now I want to compare the measurements of the length of the rod with respect to this guy and with respect to this guy. And for that, I'm going to use the Lorentz transformations. So as you may already know, the Lorentz transformations are a set of transformation equations that connect the coordinates of space and time between two observers in relative motion. And these transformation equations are consistent with the special theory of relativity. So all the ideas of special theory of relativity has led to these transformation equations. So I'm going to use these transformation equations to look at the relationship that exists between the lengths of the rod as measured by this guy and the rod as measured by this guy. So let's suppose one end of the rod is A. I say that this is point A and the other end of the rod is point number B. We are only going to measure the distances in the direction of relative motion. You see, as it turns out, the length contraction is a phenomena. It happens only along distances in the direction of relative motion. It does not happen in directions perpendicular to that of the relative motion. And relative motion here is happening in the positive x-axis, all right? So let's suppose that A has coordinates xA and xB with respect to observer in the lab frame. And the same scale has coordinates of the endpoints xA dash and xB dash with respect to the observer in the moving frame of reference. Now, let me ask you a question. The scale or this rod is at rest with respect to whom? The rod is at respect with respect to whom? It is at rest with respect to this guy. Even though this is a moving frame of reference, he is holding the rod in his hands. The rod is moving with this reference frame. So the rod is at rest with respect to this guy. Please understand this. Even though with respect to the blackboard, the lab frame is at rest and the moving frame is moving, but the rod is at rest with respect to the moving frame. Therefore, if I'm interested in measuring the length of the rod at rest, then I will say that x b dash minus x a dash is the what we can refer to as actual length, which is also in relativity referred to as proper length or rest length. So the proper length or rest length is that length as measured by an observer at rest with respect to the object. And since he is the observer at rest with respect to this rod, as both of them are moving together, so xb dash minus xa dash refers to the rest length or proper length, which I'm going to refer to as, let's suppose, del L naught. Right. So what about the other person? For him, the length of the rod is nothing but xb minus xa. So what is xb minus xa? So for this person, the rod is going forwards. It's in relative motion. For him, the length of the rod is actually the relativistic length, which I'm going to refer to as del L. So del L is the relativistic length measured by an observer with respect to which the rod is in relative motion. 
and del L0 is the rest length or proper length measured by a person who is in rest with respect to this particular rod. Understood? So the Lorentz transformations are these four equations that connect the measurements of space and time coordinates between two observers in relative motion. I don't need the last three equations, I just need the first equation that connects x, x dash and t. Alright, so using the first equation, I can connect x b dash, x a dash and x b and x a respectively. How? Well, you see, what is x b dash? x b dash is nothing but gamma x b minus v t b. What is x a dash? x a dash is equal to gamma x a minus v t a. X A and T A are measurement of the point A with respect to this observer. Now, if I just use these two equations and just subtract them, all right, X B dash minus X A dash, what is this? This is simply nothing but if I take the gamma factor out, you will end up getting X B minus X A on one hand and the rest of the terms are simply nothing but minus V T B minus T A. That's it. Now, what is TB and TA here? TB and TA are the times at which the measurement of B and A are made respectively by this observer. Now, you need to understand something here. If I am at rest with respect to the rod, I can measure the length of this rod by measuring the coordinates A and B at different times, no problem. Because I am at rest with respect to the rod, so I can measure the coordinate of A and coordinate of B. I can subtract XP minus XA, I'll get the length of the rod. But if the rod is in relative motion with respect to me, then I'll have to measure both these two endpoints coordinates at the same instant. Are you seeing? If the rod is moving with respect to me, I cannot measure the coordinate of one point at one instant and the coordinate of another point at another instant because then I'll get the distance between these two points over a period of time, which is not the length of the rod. If I'm interested in measuring the length of the rod as it is moving with respect to me, I'll have to measure both these endpoints at the same instant. What does that mean? It means that this observer must measure the endpoints A and B as the rod is moving at the same instant, which simply means that TB and TA must be same. It means that TB minus TA should be equal to zero. This is simply the idea that as an object is moving, if you want to measure the length of the object, you'll have to measure the endpoints at the same instant. Only then you'll end up getting the length. Otherwise, if you measure it at different time periods, over a course of time in which the rod is moving, then that's not the length of the rod, right? So TB minus TA must be equal to zero. So if that is equal to zero, then I simply end up getting what? I simply end up getting XB dash minus XA dash, which is the proper length delta L naught and gamma factor XB minus XA, which is nothing but the relativistic length that is delta L. Now what is gamma? Gamma is one upon root over one minus V square upon C square. So if I write this formula properly, then I simply end up getting del L is simply equal to gamma. If I take to the other side, I simply end up getting delta L naught root over one minus V square upon C square. This is the relativistic length contraction formula or also known as the Lorentz contraction formula. So this formula gives us an idea about how the measurements of distances between any two points or the measurements of the length of the rod between these two observers are related. So if you measure the length of the rod with respect to the rod being at rest, then that's your proper length delta L naught. If you measure the length of a rod when the rod is in relative motion, that is delta L and they are both related to each other by this particular formula. However, few things need to be made clear. First of all, this length contraction only happens in the direction of relative motion. It does not happen perpendicular to the direction of relative motion because y dash is equal to y and z dash is equal to z. So the direction of relative motion contributes towards the length contraction in that particular direction. Second of all, if you look at this gamma factor, this gamma factor becomes uh, prominent or becomes significant only at very, very high velocities. I'm talking about velocities comparable to the speed of light. 
let's suppose 10% the speed of light, 50% the speed of light, which is quite high. You know, the speed of light is 3 into 20 power 8 meters per second. This is the reason why we do not see length contraction at usual day-to-day -day events. We only see length contraction at very peculiar events where such velocities are achieved. In fact, I can show a, a comparison for various uh, sort of lengths. So let's suppose if we are dealing with relative velocities of let's suppose 10% the speed of light. Okay, if you want to compare what happens to length contraction or how much length contraction happens at 10% the speed of light where 10% of C is nothing but uh, what V is equal to 0.1 C. If then you want to measure, let's suppose del L, del L is nothing but delta L naught root over 1 minus V square upon C square. So 0 0.1 is nothing but 0 0.01, right? So this is nothing but delta L. Uh, so this is root over 0 0.99 which simply comes out to be around 0.995 delta L naught. So that is 99% or 99.5% the length of the rod. So at velocities of 10% the speed of light, an object gets contracted to 99.5% its original length, which is not much. However, if we go to let's suppose velocities of 90% the speed of light. If we go to velocities of 90% the speed of light, which simply means that V is equal to 0.9 C. In that case, if I calculate the relativistic length, that is nothing but del L naught root over 1 minus 0.9 C whole square, that is 0.81. This comes out to be around delta L naught root over 0.19, which comes out to be, I think, somewhere around 0.44 L naught or delta L naught. That means that the length gets contracted to 44% its original length at a velocity of 90% the speed of light. So if you look at this particular uh, graph, you can see that as the velocity is increasing from, let's suppose zero to the speed of light, then the contraction happens only when the velocities are comparable to the speed of light. So that is why we do not see these kind of length contractions in a day-to-day -day life. Now you may ask, Sir, if this is actually a fact about the nature of a universe, then uh, is there any experimental evidence? Yes, there are lots of experimental evidences regarding these kind of length contractions. I'll give you one. You see, uh, when uh, the cosmic rays strike the upper layer of the atmosphere, it leads to the creation of what is known as muon particles. These muon particles, they travel towards the ground at a velocity of around 99.8% the speed of light, which is very, very high. But their lifespan is very, very less. Their average lifespan is around 2 microseconds. Now, scientists calculated that if the muon is created at the upper layer of an atmosphere, it is traveling downwards, it has a lifespan of around 2 microseconds, then how far should it travel? According to simple calculations, you can find out that the muon should travel to somewhere in the middle or somewhere in the upper layer of the atmosphere. But as it turns out, the muons actually reach the sea level, which does not agree with the calculations. These muons, which have such a small average lifespan and should not survive in their journey towards their sea level, they should decay somewhere in the middle, they actually reach the sea level. How do you explain that? That can be explained by the length contraction. You see, as a muon is created in the upper layer of the atmosphere, it's traveling downwards and the muon is traveling at a velocity of 99.8% the speed of light, the length of the vertical distance of the atmosphere appears to have shrunk with respect to the muon. So with respect to an observer who is standing on top of the muon as it is traveling downwards, the actual distance that needs to be covered, the vertical distance of the atmosphere appears to have contracted. So that is why it so easily reaches the sea level before it decays. That is actually a very good example of length contraction. In fact, probably I'll make a video on this particular problem of muons traveling through the atmosphere and the calculations associated with it maybe sometime later on. But that's one of the examples. So this is an idea of what length contraction is. One of the consequences of the postulates of special relativity is that to make sure that the speed of light is a constant, different observers will agree on the speed of the light but they will not agree on the distances and the time periods measured by them. In the same way that we agree in Newtonian mechanics, we don't necessarily agree in special relativity. So that's it for today. In the next video, I'm going to talk about another very interesting conclusion about special relativity, which is time dilation. Till then, 